of Retro Encounter, RPG Fans Weekly Podcast of Many Topics. I'm Mike Solosi, and we're here to talk about the same game we were discussing last week, Final Fantasy XIII. Um, myself and two other panelists have finished it in time, all I think all within the last 24 hours. So uh, the somewhat confusing ending of Final Fantasy XIII is fresh in our minds, but whose minds am I referring to? It is Peter Treisenberg. Hello, everybody. And Audra Ball. Hello. Uh, Peter and Audra. Well, you know what? Just Audra. Because, um, Audra, you finished this game for the first time, uh, recently, as have I. So, yes. let's have the two of us go first. Uh, what is your overall impression of Final Fantasy XIII? Just a few sentences. What are your feelings on it? It's confusing and shiny with, uh, some moments of greatness, I think. But then it's kind of just brought down. I feel like they tried really hard to make it very um, shiny overall, maybe to the detriment of the story presentation. But I liked some of the characters and stuff, and I liked the ending, so. That's totally valid. Yeah, um, I'm maybe of a similar mind to you. I, I've been thinking about it a lot since finishing it. And uh, I agree that it's shiny. This is a, a this is generally a very beautiful game, even in the especially in the context that it was made twelve years ago. But uh, I think it's really lacking substance. Like like this 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 does not do a lot of the things that I like the most about the good Final Fantasy games. And while it's definitely trying and has, and I think it's an ambitious game. This game wanted to be a lot of things. But I'm not sure it succeeds at a lot of them. Like, like the, the 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 battle system is sometimes sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. The uh, I, I thought so many of the characters were 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 completely throwaway and are barely present in the story. I I, I unlike you, Audra, I don't know if I was attached to any of these characters. Like, I, I my I, my favorites consistently through the whole game were Lightning and Fang, but I I, I think that sometimes. The, <laughs> like dialogue happens and it sounds like total nonsense because you don't really know what any of these characters are, are thinking or doing. Every, every line of dialogue in this game is either like a quip or a dram a dramatic um, declaration or like, a, like it's, 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 it, it doesn't seem like any of the dialogue ever is just like normal communication. If that yeah. makes sense. Every single character is like has to soliloquize about the human condition before they like proceed with their day. Yeah, they're either like way too stone faced about it, again, like my girls Lightning and Fang, or they over emote everything, like, like uh, Vanille, <laughs> like like, 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 like Vanille and Snow, or, or and 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 Saz has some moments in chapters. I think five and eight are where he shines most, if, or mm -hmm. maybe it's six mm -hmm. and eight, around right around then. But uh, for the rest of the game, he's he's sort of the tired old man, and his a lot of his lines are quips. Like I, I think that this this game has good designs and some technically and artistically really beautiful visuals, but it's just badly written. And uh, and I that's fair. Yeah, and and when I I like react to you know story or characters in the game, especially in RPG, like I really think they have to get by on the strength of their writing and. This game, uh, the, the writing is stilted and weird, and there's not a lot of writing either. Like, uh, uh, a lot of games of this era will have side conversations or lots of optional dialogue or NPCs to interact with, and Final Fantasy XIII doesn't have a lot of that either. No, and it's like, you, yeah. you, you can't really... Um, and if you're looking for more context, you really have to dive into those data logs that you unlock. And yeah. while that... I do think it's commendable that this game has a feature like the data logs. And I do think that they definitely put a lot of thought into how this world operates. Um, it is not presented clearly to the player. Like I was doing some research after um, I f beat the game and the game really does not do a good job of telling you how many um, Falsi are in cocoon. Like I thought it was just like going to be a few. No, basically every big machine like the big airship that Birth Andalus flies is also another Falsi. Oh. <laughs> like like the 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 big um crane thing that was carrying the pulse vestige, Falsi. 
Yeah, like like when you meet when you meet the Carbuncle Falci in uh it, when you're in um Palimporum, it's basically looks like a you know, an enormous generator. Mm-hmm. So like I like like I think of Falci as being sentient massive crystals that have specific function and sentience, which makes sense, but uh but they really but 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 you're right, they underexplain and underdeliver to the player how many how much Falci are in Cocoon. It's like yeah. it's like every single major uh, automation in the city is a sentient robot and like that is a cool concept like i really do love this setting but it is um at the way it is presented to the player and the way the fact that you don't really get to explore until chapter 11 which we'll get into um i think really hurts the game because chapter 11 is really the only part of the game where i really felt invested in the world like oh i actually get to explore more, more, a couple more things on this game's writing and how they present information to the player. This was a little bit a uh, a trend of the times, having a lot of information that was not in the text of the story to be backloaded into a codex or what they call it a data log in F- in FF thirteen. Um, Mass Effect, I think, is a major culprit of that, and I I just recently replayed Mass Effect one. But uh, Peter, you were dancing around a little bit. You, do you know where I think the best writing of this entire game is? Uh, do tell. In the um, descriptions of the Seath missions in Chapter Eleven, I don't oh, disagree. Yes. <laughs> the uh, we'll, we'll skip ahead a little bit, then go circle back to Chapter Ten, I guess. In Chapter Eleven, is it's the only open world area of the whole game. Peter was alluding to it before. They dump you onto the world of Grand Pulse. It's a giant nonlinear map. You have to go to a couple story exclamation point zones, and I think you're required to complete the first nine or ten missions. And then, yeah, eventually it, it makes you do a few of them, yeah. Yeah, and, and so there's about 30 of them, and I think you have to do something like 15 or 20 of them to, to find your way out of the starting area and then to go through uh, the the, um, the tower dungeon at the end of it. Mm-hmm. But but a lot of it's optional. And every one of these quests is it, it, like includes a, 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 a memoriam from a Lissy, from Pulse, from probably hundreds of years ago, describing um what their uh what their focus was what their what their quest for being was and uh and and how they failed and were turned into crystal and so by finding their crystal activating it you find out what what their task was if you go and complete that task for them then you get a reward and some of those crystals become transfer uh teleport teleportation waypoints so it's this game is 13 chapters 12 of them are well, well, let's be a little bit generous here. Uh, uh, 10 or 11 of them are linear corridors. Then uh, you have one or two of them that are sort of large single set dungeons that have some nonlinearity. And then just one of them, chapter 11, is like three times the size of any other chapter and is uh, and has a lot of nonlinearity and optional content and hidden and hidden things and optional bosses. And it's it's just, it almost is like an entirely different game. No, you're absolutely right, Slosi. And um, there's act- and there's like sixty plus Seath missions because you unlock a bunch more in the post game. So the game really does. Ex- right. The game really does expect you to like go back in there. And there and these are and these these aren't just like throwaway quests. There are fully voiced NPCs involved in some of the later ones. Like um, they really. This is really where the brunt of the game's content is, and if you're going to be engaging with it, and per, for my money, I think it's the best part of the game. I, that was the only part of the game where I was running around. I'm like, you know what? I'm getting cool bits of lore. I'm getting to explore this world. The I thought the tower dungeon in Chapter Eleven was like really good. It actually is like a, a proper Final Fantasy dungeon. It's the um, I think it's the only proper Final Fantasy dungeon in this entire game. Perhaps. It is so maybe, maybe, like maybe the the entirety of Chapter Thirteen. Maybe the arc in chapter ten, but but the, that's the one that feels like a dungeon ass dungeon in a good way. Yes, yes, it does, and I I was having a lot of fun with the game in that point. And then once you get back to chapter twelve, and it's just linear corridors and mobs of enemies and cutscene, and then mobs of enemies and then cutscene and then boss fight. I was just like, oh yeah, right. This game is boring sometimes. This game is. Boring. And then talking about those cutscenes, uh, we were talking about this off air a little bit before we recorded, but. Uh, these the game. This game has some beautiful cutscenes and some very flashy and dramatic and shiny ones. Uh, the racetrack uh, scene. <laughs> yeah, the, the, oh, yeah, there's the racetrack scene at the uh, beginning of chapter twelve, and that um, and that and some of the ones in the, around the oh, I guess around the middle of the game, like before you separate in chapter five. So uh, uh, probably chapter like be, b- in between chapters three and four, I think. Like yeah, there are so. s- there are straight up like 
um, spaceship dogfighting scenes. And, and, you know, like action movie running away from explosions, leaping off of building scenes like a lot of them are good. But this it, it gave me and I'm sure this comparison has been made a billion times over the intervening 12 years. But there's a lot of Star Wars in this game. Just oh, yeah. and and the, oh, yes. but, the, but the crazy thing is they have all this Star Wars ass stuff like giant robots and spaceship dog fights and uh, and all this action on a racetrack. But you don't play any of it. <laughs> My theory is that. Um, the outline of this plot was made way in advance, which is which you know they should have done, of course. And then they made these cutscenes before filling in all of the gaps of gameplay. And probably some of these cutscenes were intended to have playable parts, but because this game was over budget and had a really tightened d- development cycle at the end, like I think that at some point there was a race a racetrack mini game and a space shooter mini game that we never got because this game just was sprinting to its development end cycle. Oh, that's interesting. I could see that. Uh, uh, like otherwise why have well, like like why have a racetrack at all? Why have multiple like dogfighter scenes? And, and yeah. I say dogfighting, I I mean dogfighting as in planes dogfighting and not actual animal yes. cruelty. Yes, yes, we, we understand. Yeah. We understand. Like like, um, like like World War 2 Battle of Britain stuff. Yeah, but like, and you're, but you're right though. It's like in that racetrack, um, the the mo- the beginning parts of chapter twelve are set on this like abandoned racetrack, um, and it's like, wow, this this really seems like there should be more to this than it just being another linear corridor um, for enemy encounters. But um, yeah, and I and I almost I'm almost certain that you're correct um, uh, on that on on your assumption of how they wrote the story and made the cutscenes. It kind of reminds me of the third Pirates of the Caribbean movie in a weird way where they were very open about the fact that they storyboarded and, and, and came up with all the action sequences and then wrote the plot as filler. I don't know if I quite go that far. Cause I, I think square really wanted this world to be compelling and interesting. Cause they have a lot of, they have a lot of lore and stuff like that in this game, but you have to like really dig for it. It's not presented to the player. Well at all. I feel like they spent a lot of time trying to make really shiny, nice looking cutscenes instead of devoting more to story presentation. Yeah, no, that's totally valid. Yeah, they invested a lot in making the art assets for this game and making beautiful cutscenes. But then when it came to, you know, surrounding, like surround them with actual game, we got these linear corridors that I found pretty frustrating. And we got, uh, again, no town or NPC interaction. For as much as I liked what Chapter 11 was about, uh, at least when you're there in chapter 11, I don't think there's a single NPC. Like, like the closest thing you have to another character is one this one lightning gargoyle that taunts you a few times, and the and the friendly statues that help you through the tower. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no character interaction. It's not until post game, and even then, it's only Titan. Like, it's um, it's one of the fallacy, and um, it, Titan does have fully voiced dialogue, but it's not like it's it's cutscenes. It's not like you go up to Titan and are like. Hey, buddy, tell me things. And you, you, and you aren't exaggerating about how much of an emphasis this game puts on its end game. Because when I was looking around at guides uh, j- just to casually look up things like I, I don't know, like like what upgrade I did I needed to upgrade my uh, my taming pole or something. Mm-hmm. Um, a huge amount of the guides and material on FF13 is how to affic- uh, excuse me how to efficiently farm adamantoises which give you like uh, I think eighty thousand CP and uh, and and drop two of the best items in the game at, at like mm-hmm. one to five percent. Yeah, yeah, trape- trapeze drones, which you need to up- yeah, 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 get yeah, your yeah, ultimate yeah. weapons. Yeah, tra- uh, trape- uh, trapeze trapezohedrons for upgrading every ultimate weapon, and also uh, platinum ingots, which you can sell for one hundred and fifty thousand gil. Like those are the two things they drop. Uh, yeah, and I I got a couple of those platinum ingots because I did the robot repair quest in chapter Fuck eleven. D. Yeah, and and oh, I, think, I missed I missed the robot. God dang it! No, yeah. it, it it helped it helped me it so much because I I found Bakti, I found the little five or six robot parts to repair him, and then if you every time you get one of those title rewards, um, he'll give you a prize for every title that you give for him. Oh nice! And, and because I had I had killed a couple I don't know I I think I'd killed a couple optional bosses and found a, a couple extra things. He gave me uh, about about a half million gil worth of things to sell. That's uh, cool. So I was able to just immediately max out, like uh, max out a couple of my weapons, um, just because, just because I, I I backtracked a little bit to talk to Bakhti. So again, chapter eleven, 
as, it, as you go through this enormous uh, Grand Pulse grassy area, then then uh, th some very, very beautiful sort of cliffs, then creeks, then, uh, th then, then an underground tunnel, an abandoned mine facility, then... Uh, the, then this tower dungeon which is uh, which is like already a few, which is big enough to be a few hours where you have to you know uh, uh complete a couple of these extra seeth missions and have like the parts of the tower spin around and interlock to open the way forward uh mm -hmm. with, with a with a boss at the end called dahaka which i know is a I, which i know is a, is a demon from middle eastern folklore but it just makes me think of the uh of the uh, uh, pursuant boss from uh, Prince of Persia, Warrior Within. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. and um, and also um, there is actually another optional boss in that tower too. Um, if you if you do if go out of your way to to um, do a few extra missions and reorient the tower a certain way, when you take the elevator back down to the bottom, there's one of those undying seeth is down there. Yeah, no, like, it, it, it's it's only cool. it's, it's only one extra mission, and I think that was one of the missions that got me one hundred and fifty thousand gil from uh, from our boy Bakti. Mm -hmm. But the uh, but 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 yeah, like this is a pretty good dungeon, and then another a smaller dungeon at the end, which is Erba, the ruins of the uh, town that Fang and Vanille lived in a hun uh, hundreds of years ago. And this is all one chapter, and it it just kicks the ass of every previous chapter. Mm -hmm. So so I'm I'm trying to imagine like if let's say they had more time and budget and could make a game where more of the game felt like uh felt this? like chapter 11 <laughs> um I, i'm i'm imagining you know like a couple maybe hub cities in in cocoon that uh give you a little a little bit of area to of uh, excuse me a little bit of freedom to explore and backtrack and maybe uh maybe chapter 11 is the same size but it's like a bigger portion of the game like Maybe only maybe the first five chapters are in Cocoon. The next five are in Grand Pulse, and then there's a couple at the end for the grand finality. Finale, mm -hmm. but I, I think what I'm describing is something like FF12, FF15, or or FF7 remake. Like these, those games all have big open areas, but also town areas and breaks in the pace of the story and open areas that have some forward momentum and some idea of a destination because there's there's yeah. sometimes in, in 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 chapter 11 you don't really know where to go or what to do other than follow the golden exclamation point so like i i think that this combination of a, this sort of idea of a directed open world like sort of like ff12 is what square enix was trying to make at this time but they they really couldn't do it so that's why we got corridor chapter 11 corridor Yep, I, and I and I th I think you're right, and I also think um, that that is sort of a trend in JRPGs nowadays. We especially find these semi-open worlds where there, it's not really an open world, but it is a big environment with lots of little things off the beaten path. And I do think that later Square Enix games, especially Final Fantasy VII Remake, take the kernels of what Thirteen tried to do and run with them. Like the Seven Remake feels like what if Thirteen, but we finished it. Yeah, like me. instead of ha instead of having an, an enormous sandbox with a, with a perfectly uh, um, uh, contiguous world, like like your Breath of the Wild or your Elden Ring, we got uh, a lot of JRPGs of this time, or, or even today, are like uh, a series of set of medium sized sandbox sandboxes connected by little I don't know bridges or tunnels or something. Yeah, like your Tales of Arises or your Shin Megami Tensei Fives or, or, like or all that stuff. Yeah, or every Xenoblade game does a pretty yeah. good job of that. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, but like, like so, like I, I think thirteen wanted to be one of those large open areas, but with some direction to them. But they ultimately couldn't, and so they just put all of the nonlinearity into one part of the game. And I, I know I'm hammering on that point maybe a little bit too much, but it bothered me a little bit. Like it is, it is really difficult to underscore. I think that that is the only part of the game that feels complete and fun. And like, it, and even then, it's still sort of empty. And I wish there was more in it. Yeah, like, I, I, you're going to be spending a lot of time on Grand Pulse if you want to engage with this game's endgame content, which, uh, full disclosure, I thought about doing before I got into this plot, and then I took a look at some of those requirements, and I was like, nah, nah, I'm good. Uh, I don't have enough time in my life to get that platinum. I'm sorry, guys. Um, uh, but uh, Yeah, it, uh, yeah the, the platinum trophy, the, uh, the real mofos on it are um, uh, obtaining every single weapon and accessory Getting five stars on every Seath mission. <laughs> yeah, five stars on every single Seath mission. I think there's around sixty of them. About thirty in Chapter Eleven, and then, in, and, and then they and then they unlock all of them in the post game. But which includes for Singatorix, which is one of the game's two super bosses, and you have to kill a long gooey, which is the hardest of those turtles. 
I think long gooey might just mean like I think that it might just mean dragon turtle or something. It <laughs> yeah. does. No, it does. Yeah, um, and those... and uh, and and Vercingetorix was a uh, was a Gaulish chieftain that was I think the last one to stand up against the, against Caesar. So maybe there's some metaphor there that I'm not. Yeah, no, all of the undying are named after Roman legionnaires for the most part, and I think that's a really cool um, cool detail. Um, but uh, those turtles scare me, man. <laughs> like I actually, I actually really, it's, there's something I find unsettling about them. The fact that like they walk around the environment, you just hear the footsteps. They don't aggro onto you, but you also can't sneak up on them. Um, and then once you enter a battle, they take one step and you just die. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I I know I mentioned Xenoblade a second ago, but uh, I mean that that's the territorial Rotbard in a nutshell, right? Like, yeah, they, it they, is. They they they, uh, they they present enormous, unfathomably strong enemies that you uh, that you know at 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 lower levels, your goal is to avoid them, and and then but then if you you know if you get swole and come back, then you, then uh, you can take then mm-hmm. you know taking them on becomes part of the end game, but uh, they backload so much into the end game. That mm-hmm. a lot of players became very invested in it. So there's there are guides and uh, and other things for how to defeat all these bosses and how to farm most efficiently because you need mm-hmm. literally millions and millions of gil to have the uh, to have enough upgrade materials to me- to level up every single accessory and get and uh, to you know to have them transformed into the better accessories because you need to own every single one in the game for one trophy. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's a like, lot. It's it's a lot to max out. And and while I I found upgrading stuff in in FF thirteen really fun because one of my joys of video games is upgrading weapons, mm-hmm. especially if they transform into better ones. So I, I liked that in FF thirteen, but still, but it's it's just so much. It is definitely a lot. Uh, do we want to go back to chapter nine and ten real quick and just talk about um the arc and Barthandalus? Because I think we should probably start going through the story a little bit. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Um, we we cut off at chapter nine where uh lightning hope fang and snow were trying to rescue saz and vanil who had been captured after the events of chapter eight in the uh the city of dreams i forget what it's called already nautilus yeah yeah, yeah. Know, nautilus. the most dis- the, the most disappointing zone in video game history i mean what <laughs> it's 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 pretty sad i mean it, it, it's like hey this is gonna be like the gold saucer or trino or just a big metropolis and it's just another empty corridor you will be here for an hour and you will do nothing. Except follow chocobos. Yeah, the most interesting part of, of that was a very, very bare bones chocobo scavenger hunt that I frankly could have done with more of. <laughs> I, I do I do love this game's I do love this game's techno chocobo theme when you're on um when you're on cocoon. That is one of my favorite pieces of music in the game. And Pulse to Chocobo, when you when you uh, do the Chocobo missions on Grand mm-hmm. Pulse and can un- unlock Chocobos to ride on the map, that, that's a pretty good ch- arrangement of the Chocobo theme. Also, it's a very it's a very good track. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. In general, but, the music is very good. But yeah, no, yeah. Hamuzu is blameless for uh, the for the faults and dis- and uh, uh, and grievan- you know, and grievances I have with FF13. You, you know, you know that meme of the dude who's like playing piano and the piano's on fire. Uh, it, it, that's like Hamuzu, except it's a string section that's on fire. <laughs> Like, yeah, like, 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 especially my favorite piece of music in the game is actually probably Saber's Edge, like the normal boss theme, just because that's those soaring strings that kick in right when the fight starts is like, it's just so good. So are, are we thinking that this is, um, that Hama Uzu is the string quartet playing in the James Cameron Titanic movie that, uh, that, 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 that keeps playing as the ship is sinking and everyone's panicking around them. <laughs> Masashi Yama Uzu just looking around nervously as, as fi- at Final Fantasy XIII's sinking ship. Yeah, and, and it's, and, uh, but, and, you know, I think in that movie, I hope I'm not misquoting it, uh, or at least I'm paraphrasing it, they keep playing, then they sort of look at everything around them, one of them goes, gentlemen, it's been an honor, and they keep playing. <laughs> yes, yeah. that is what happens. <laughs> Yeah, they did. So, yeah. All right. Well, I mean, maybe that's a little bit too unkind to FF13, which is a game that I was mostly enjoying, but then just it, it troubles me looking back on it. But going back to Chapter 9, um, at, at the end of Chapter 9, the uh, a big dramatic rescue mission, um, uh, Barthandalus outs himself as a Falci, murders uh, uh, Cocoon Bayonetta Jill and everyone else in the room, uh, and you, 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 fight, yeah, you, fight a, uh, you fight a boss battle against Barthandalus, and then... Bartandalus communicates that he that his goal that everything he's done like both the pulse falci and the cocoon falci has been to create a, gr- a group of strong lacy 
that can destroy Orphan, which is the most powerful Falci in Cocoon and sort of the, the, the heart and great power source of Cocoon. Which sounds confusing because at this point, uh, the, the, our heroes are like, well, we were given powers by the Pulse Falci, so our, our goal is probably to stop the Cocoon Falci or to maybe even destroy Cocoon or save Cocoon or something. But the but it, it looks like that the Cocoon Falci have the same goal, but their but their goal is also to destroy all of Cocoon, especially the humans on it, so that the the great beings called makers that made Pulse and Cocoon can re can then remake them because the Falci are dissatisfied with the current state of Cocoon and Pulse. Yeah. Sort of? Yes. Do, do, do you want me to get into the Fabula Nova Chrysalis lore, Solosi? Uh, a little bit. Give me the abridged version. Okay. Okay. Um, so the Falci from Cocoon were created by the goddess Lindsay. Um, Lindsay and Pulse are two massive Falci that were also created by another creator god, and that's a whole other thing. But basically... Um, there's a theme in 13's mythology of like absconded parents, essentially people looking at the divine as though they were like, um, as though they were parental figures. So Lindsay and Pulse create their respective Falci and then peace out. Um, there's a third goddess named Etro, who's like the goddess of death. And the ultimate goal of the Falci is to open Etro's gate because they believe that by opening Etro's gate, they will be able to peer into the other side and see their maker again. And they, the only way to open Etro's gate, they think, is to cause enough mass death, because Etro is the goddess of death, basically cause enough mass death that it will force the gate to open. So their plan is to raise a whole bunch of people inside Cocoon, and get a, 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 a Lissy to destroy it and send it out of the sky. Because the Pulsi, the Falci can't do it themselves. They were made to maintain Cocoon. Their, their, their nature as benefactors and, like, it does not allow them to actually intervene and destroy the city themselves. So it's like the laws of robotics. Yes, it is exactly um, I, I'm Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics. But the loophole that they were they discovered is that, well, we can't do it, and we can't make Lassie. A cocoon Lassie could not do this. But if we get some Pulse Lassie and we manipulate them into doing it for us, then that'll accomplish our goal. Basically, it, it, Barthandalus is playing four-dimensional chess over here. <laughs> now, um, a, a, a couple a couple reactions to that. I, I, I gathered some of that from the story. Like, Barthandalus makes it clear that all of the humans are a sacrifice to draw the attention of the Maker. Like, the, the, I, I didn't know anything about Lindsay or Etro, but they did basically tell you, or at least mostly explain to you, that if enough people die at once and Cocoon's destroyed, that will at least you know get the attention of the maker so the maker can return and and i yeah. think that uh, and i also sort of gleaned uh, b before we recorded today that the uh the final boss or that 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 final falci that you fight is called orphan because it was a child of the maker and then the maker abandoned its creation and yes. so and and mm -hmm. so that that creation which is maybe all of the falci but orphan in particular is 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 almost like longing or seeking attention of their departed maker. So like I I, I was like and uh, um uh, Audrey, you and I played a game last month where there is a let's avoiding some spoilers from tales of, for tales of Exilia. There is a god that creates a very powerful spirit, but then with when the spirit doesn't hear any feedback from the god over decades, uh becomes like becomes uh becomes lost and and fi and uh and goes a little crazy for for uh for out of a lack out of a lack of direction and purpose you know you know what i mean right yes so there's so like abandonment issues are i suppose some core tenets of ff13 and <laughs> this is, tales, this is and a, tales of exilia <laughs> this is a theme that J japanese games industry was apparently going through in the 2010s and, yeah huh? and, and, and both those games were were made around the same time i think i think exilia was supposed to be 2010 but got delayed a year because it, yeah. it ended up, ended up missing the 15 year anniversary of tales of that way but mm -hmm. uh so i i gathered part of that part of barthandalus's intentions 
but the thing is, Barthandalus is not just manipulating the Lassie, like our our heroes and all of the other Lassie over centuries. Um, they specifically have the Cocoon Society set up to to foment rebellion and to have the populace of Cocoon hate Lassie. So that they, they they don't want they don't just want the Lassie to destroy all of Cocoon. They want Cocoon to erupt in rebellion and conflict, and then and then be destroyed by Lassie. So like yes. so so all all of the propaganda machine going on in Cocoon, which is which is alluded to plenty of times over the course of the game, is also part of the grand plan for Cocoon to completely explode, so the maker can remake Cocoon and Pulse and everything else. It's yeah, basically they... a powder keg. Yeah, no, it's definitely a powder keg. And Barthandalus has made sure that he has backup plans in case the Lissi don't come through for him. Like, he, like he's basically taunting them in Chapter 11. He's basically taunting them like, okay, look, if you guys don't come back and take care of this yourselves, like, they're just going to do it. They're just going to do it. So, you know, why don't you, why don't you intervene? And, and, and also, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think that uh, you, you fight Barthandalus at the end of Chapter 9, Um you win but he's a little bit he's a little bit disappointed he's like hmm is that all you have like kind of a classic you know uh, yeah. jrpg villain thing God, so I, so you while you're seen my true power yeah it's like this isn't even my final form it's um, not so, it turns out it's not. yeah but so you you escape the airship on a smaller airship and our uh and the airship is guided without saz controlling it into a mysterious structure called an arc and uh vanil and fang are familiar with what arcs are and they were used as like training facilities for Lassie and were built by Falsi. So am I, am I misinterpreting or you, did Barthandalus find you a little wanting, teleported you to a training facility, and then all of chapter 10 is breaking out of the training facility, just at, at, which is also part of Barthandalus's plan for you to get stronger? Yes. No, you're not, yes. you're not entirely wrong. He basically sent you to school. Uh, so he, he so chapter 10 is a training montage in which you are co- cooperating with the villain to get yourself stronger yeah so like chapter chapter and and then he also has got like a bunch of the, the the arcs are also another one of his backup plans where he's like he's got a bunch of like pulse monsters stored in there like in break glass in case of um in case of emergency i'm pretty <laughs> i'm pretty sure that when the uh that when uh, monsters start attacking uh cocoon and eden through all of chapter 12 that's where those monsters came from that is where they came yeah. from which means he's got an adam man toys in one of those things somewhere and that's really funny to me <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why um but um yeah chapter 10 chapter 10 and then um can i i, I want to inter- i want to interrupt just for a second because i want to talk about this I, I will keep this brief but there's actually dummied out content in final fantasy 13 for a second arc you would have gone I'm not, to i'm not surprised i mean <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh, so and, and the thing is it was cut late in development the area is called the seventh arc it is not accessible in game normally unless you uh hack use cheating devices but it has fully voiced and fully localized dialogue the, the voice the voices are japanese it wasn't recorded in english um the area is mostly a reskin of the current arc, but it ends with a unique boss fight against a foul sea called Nemesis, um, which has no AI script, but um, um, is in the game, has a model. Um, they, the, this was apparently cut late into development and was originally planned to be sold as DLC for Final Fantasy XIII. Uh, this obviously never materialized because, you know, 13's re- the reaction to thirteen was what it was. But instead, they worked some of those ideas into thirteen two. Um, the model for Nemesis is reused as a boss in thirteen two, and I, it's, this is a minor detail. But I always thought that was really interesting. Oh yeah, that is pretty interesting. I I, I love seeing stuff like that in games. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's sometimes startling the amount of things that get cut out or put back in. I mean, I mean the uh, there's an entire story arc in Near Replicant that was cut from the PS360 version and then added back in at the uh, uh, in the for the Replicant PS4 version. So that like it it and um, large portions of I think it was a uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic two that were restored in fan patches. Oh yes, they're coming out in Switch. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, they they were and they were added back. In, in the recent re-release, because uh, um, uh, what, what are they called? Um, Obsidian was mostly cooperative with these uh, this decade plus of fan patches to you know sort of to sort of uh, rebuild the game that they made. So that Obsidian it's, rules. 
well, we can talk about in 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 the arc though we find um Sid Reigns who as um as it turns out Reigns is a cocoon lassie. He's been doing bad things for Barthandalus this whole time. And Yeah, and and, mm-hmm. and yeah, Sid is we should mention is the uh the leader of the cavalry, which is a por- which is another military branch that I think is unrelated to the to Psycom or the uh or, or or the guardians. Uh, I, th- I think they're like an elite branch of Guardian Corps. Oh, like that, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, they're super cops. Yeah, and and um, uh, the cavalry were who Fang uh, initially connected with when she was um trying to escape Cocoon and then and then find Vanille and then and uh and it was you know uh, Fang was with cavalry soldiers when she picked up Snow after Chapter Three. So we mm-hmm. think of cavalry as the military that are, is our allies, but it turns out they're just another puzzle piece in the grand machinations of Barthandalus and Sid, who it, it probably is a noble-hearted human who wanted a good solution but is really unable to find one. And he thinks that because your goal is to destroy Cocoon and Sid is starting to maybe rebel against Barthandalus's ideas, he decides that his ideal outcome is to destroy you just to maybe set Barthandalus back a few decades. <laughs> yeah, so he that's why you fight him. And you have to put him out of his misery, rip femboy Sid. <laughs> and there's also, a, um, in chapter 12, they uh, Barthandalus creates a fake Sid to be the new Primarch of Cocoon. Oh, it's and, not a fake. Uh, it's it's not a fake. Oh, I'm sorry. It, 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 it was the real one. He um yeah. So the the Falci can basically once someone turns to crystal from fulfilling their focus, they can uncrystallize them at any time and give them a new focus. It's oh, basically sure. it's basically perpetual servitude. Um, yeah, so okay. that, that well, is so, the so real we, Sid. But it, but it was still yeah. I mean, but it was the real Sid. But it was a it was definitely a depressed, enslaved Sid in, yeah. in chapter twelve. But yeah, that, yeah, that's he a, had that's, given up. He had given up. Yeah, that's a little bit of a sad scene too, because it, it's cavalry soldiers that confront Sid during the Eden raid. That is most of chapter twelve, and uh, and I mean they they shoot Sid in cold blood. It's 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 a bummer. And he asked them to do it. Like yeah, mm-hmm. it is it is really really the Sid in this game is really kind of a sad character. He does have a pimp and coat, though. <laughs> he does have a nice coat. He has a, he has a nice he has nice hair and a nice coat, which you could also say of uh, of Peter's favorite character, Rosh. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Yag Rosh. He yeah. died as he lived, accomplishing absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah, Jill, Rosh, and Sid could be good NPCs or villains because I mean, all, all three of them are basically villains that are at least not. 100 percent evil to the core villains yeah they're villains with human motivation they they could have been interesting but they are so barely present i didn't feel attached to any of them i i I, like like, and and i think of classic final fantasy villains that that always have a presence and are some of the best villains in rpg history like Mm -hmm. they but like i i think final fantasy is a series with a lot of great jrpg villains but this ain't it like like, like, I mean, the, 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 the best... owl. Yeah, Barth- <laughs> Minerva. Yeah, Barthandalus's owl that he, uh, that he, like, Power Rangers transforms in uh, with to for to make a super orpha mech, like orphan mech. It, n- n- I, I did. I, I thought all of the villains in this game were in- underwhelming. The best villain of Final Fantasy thirteen are those damn transforming behemoths. Oh God, those things are so uh, annoying. Yeah. <laughs> you, you either, you either. If you're lucky enough to get a preemptive strike, you can you can stagger them quickly and then just make just keep them in air juggling them until they die. Yeah, but if they need, transform before that, they fully heal and they you become need, really yeah, hard. You need to haste yourself and keep them in the air so they can't land enough to to transform into their bipedal form. Because otherwise, yeah. they're still beatable, but they're a giant. But they completely heal, uh, heal to full, lose all their debuffs, and you have to and are and deal way more damage and are just a giant pain in the ass. So yeah, they really are the behemoths um, in this game. I'm I. I was avoiding them a lot by the end, not not because I couldn't beat them, but because I just didn't want to deal with them. Because the fight's yeah. going to take like five minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that was the thing about chapter 13. Oh, this is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves a bit, but I, I'm just going to jump in with combat discussion. I think um, the combat in this game is a very good proof of concept as far as a faster paced active time battle goes. I think the paradigm shift system is kind of a neat idea. I like being able to change roles on the fly. I like, okay, so like the enemy's charging up for a big attack, switch to sentinels. Uh, you need to heal, switch to medic. You need to, do, to build up a chain gauge, ravagers. And um, the main thing is that you get animation locked the first time you paradigm shift every single time. It does not matter. And when you're in that animation lock, enemies can still do damage to you. you they can still launch you. They can still like all this other stuff. 
So if unless you're in the exact right paradigm, you're there's a chance that the enemies will all target one of your characters and you'll just be screwed. Yeah, especially if it's the leader. The game operates on Persona 3 logic, where if the main character you're controlling dies, it is game over because you don't have a you can't take control of another party member. They fixed this in 13-2. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh. But yeah, but yeah, the the paradigm switch system is is what drives a lot of the combat variety in this game because I mean the, there's only six jobs and they each have a defined role and that's cool and the setting up different combinations of them and rapidly switching between them for the, for situations like you described Peter is is some of the fun of combat in FF13. But I I still by the end I was sort of handling every fight the same way unless and and, and uh, unless certain circumstances would make me maybe adjust my parameters but I, I eventually i settled on um two sets of paradigms one if i was doing lightning fang vanille and one if i was doing lightning fang hope <laughs> that my final party was lightning fang hope um uh because so i could sent, i could sentinel and two medics if i needed to and then the re- the, the rest of it were um uh commando Commando, Saboteur, Synergist, followed by Ravager, Saboteur, Ravager, followed yeah, I, by Commando, Ravager, Ravager. <laughs> I, um, well, yeah, I, 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 I my, my setup was also Hope for a lot of the time, but if, but if I was using, um, Vanille instead of Hope, because Vanille's a better healer than Hope, and she's, yes. a, and she's a slightly better, uh, Saboteur than Fang. But, uh, but but she doesn't learn slow or or uh, or or days and so uh, fang having fang for those is is helpful but uh mm-hmm. but in, in general at towards the end i was using lightning fang hope and my two offensive ones were commander commando ravager ravager with fang is the commando for when i wanted to build up meter commando mm-hmm. commando ravager when i when uh, something was broken cuz commandos deal way more damage than ravagers once something mm-hmm. is uh, is, uh, is 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 made vulnerable then I had uh, Sentinel Medic Medic for healing, um, Commando Ravager, uh, Saboteur for debuffing but keeping damage up, Commando Ravager Synergist for when I wanted to um, build up every uh, when I wanted to have a normal fight with while building enemy meter but also buffing myself, and if I just had to reset and spread around buffs and debuff, debuffs, I had I had Medic Synergist mm-hmm. uh, Saboteur. Audrey, what was your setup? If you... Mine was um, Vanille, Zaz, and Fane. And Ooh. pretty much I used most, like, Ravager, Ravager, Commando, and I did. I found um, Medic, Commando, Commando, once I staggered something was really helpful, especially if I needed a quick heal. Mm-hmm. Oh, that and is, that Sentinel is a good one. Synergist and Medic was great, and I loved using a double Saboteur with Ravager just to keep chaining but also be get all the debuffs yeah mm-hmm. yeah like like buffing and debuffing is very strong in this game so it i is. think that uh so and the and i was using um lightning fang vanille for a lot but i really really missed having a good synergist so i uh and and hope is also the best ravager and uh and probably tied with saz for the best synergist because i mean i mean saz has haste Hope has the defensive uh, ones, but then they, yeah, but but then mm-hmm. they but then they both eventually learn each other's skills later in the yeah. game. So, I, so so by the end, when Hope had uh, had haste, it's like all right, I guess you're you're the on the team now. Yeah, I was able to. Um, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm bragging a little bit. I've already bragged to you guys, but I was able to five star <laughs> the final boss um, with um, with Hope's um, Hope putting haste on the whole party. Then having Fang keep debuffing it while the other two went Ravager, and then finally just once it got staggered, just going to town with Commando Ravager Ravager because Ravager will keep building the chain gauge while your Commando's doing damage. So if you can get that chain gauge up to nine hundred ninety nine, all of a sudden your Commando's every attack is doing like twenty thirty k damage, and it's like this. It's very satisfying once the combat yes. clicks. I had I had commando hits going up into 50 or 60k just because like I had a maxed out taming I had a maxed out uh Venus Gospel and uh and a maxed out Lionheart um mm-hmm. oh, and, and a maxed out Flamberge but I, I, you don't get the Lionheart until chapter 12 so I was using the I was using the <laughs> I had lightning on her starting sword the entire game just because I was always having her as I was always having her just switch between commando ravager and medic the, like all the time Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, basically what uh, she never left because I always need one of those three jobs, like always. 
So, oh, yeah. and, and she's and she's the second best commando after Fang and the second best Ravager after Hope. So she's just really good. Um and uh so like giving her her keep having her keep her starting weapon, uh, which is you know, high magic or like above average magic and above average uh, above average physical was great. And uh so other than you know, I had her use the Gladius or whatever in the first two chapters before we have jobs, but then I but then it was the Blaze Fire Saber and the Flamberge until I got the Lionheart and maxed out the Lionheart. Mm-hmm. I love that the starting weapons are viable if you upgrade them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe not for every character, but uh, but but lightnings. I I felt like it was it's her second or third best weapon. But the, the Lionheart having really great stats and also randomly uh um automatically staggering enemies if they're oh, at, man. if if they're at above I think it's above ninety percent or above eighty percent. So you, you'll you'll get you'll get way more staggering mm-hmm. with the Lionheart, and that that's I, pretty great. Yeah, I've got I got really lucky with a couple of those instant um instant stagger abilities. Like I think I don't know if they stack. But like, um, I was able to get, I was able to take out. Um, it was one of those giant motorcycle enemies in the final dungeon, like in like really quickly because I got a lucky one. And it's like, oh, that's lucky. nice. Mm-hmm. In general, I think the fact that we're talking about our combat setups like this does show that this game is doing something right. It's just that when the games, when the combat goes off the rails, and it is very easy for the wheels to come off, like because all of a sudden if every enemy you're fighting decides to tar- gang up on somebody, which is complete RNG, whether that happens, then all of a sudden your whole strategy is like kind of kaput. Yeah, you can, like, only, you can only manipulate enemy attention with a sentinel, and, that, and even then, unless you're controlling the sentinel, uh, and, it, it, and the sentinel is your, at your first position, uh, you, you, you can't do that with as much control as I, as I would like most of the time. Mm-hmm. So it's... Uh, this is a good version of ATB, and whenever you have turn-based combat that feels fast, I think that is a that is an uh, an ideal uh, level of combat pacing that only a few games can really accomplish. So it's 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 good at that, but also, I mean, you're using the same toolkit of those six jobs for the entire game, and I like I, I if there was more weapons or more skills or more jobs, I think that could have helped it a little bit just to. J- just so my chapter 13 fights didn't seem exactly the same as my chapter 5 fights. Yeah, yeah that's once the... you get the paradigms you like, it's pretty much rinse and repeat. Really all that changes is that fights get longer because the chapter 5 yes. fights were taking... And, and it wasn't like, oh, they're taking too long because I'm underleveled. I was still getting 5-star ratings. It's just that every battle took 5 minutes. And the, oh, and you really have to buff yourself and debuff the enemies if you want to get them down in a time, timely mm-hmm. manner because well, the, yeah. the, like a lot of people will a lot of enemies will have like uh, half damage or just enormous amounts of HP. Yeah, and or or like the the um, the sacrifices in the final zone can inflict instant death, which has a very low chance of landing, but it can land. I, and I think if it, I think even if it doesn't auto kill. It deals a lot of damage and hits you with multiple debuffs. Uh, uh, they have they have a second attack that does the okay, debuffs, okay, but um, yeah. but v- Vanille actually has the death skill, and that's your main way of farming those giant turtles. Yeah, um, no, I mean, I saw those guides. It's like a farming turtle farming adamantoids with Vanille death without Vanille death. Like we're uh-huh. <laughs> two of the options. Also, uh, also apparently that's also one of the main ways to beat one of the super bosses because if you use the death spell and then switch to three commandos before it lands. It increases the damage for the whole party, so the death spell will actually do close to nine nine ninety nine 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 hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine damage if you're, the enemy is staggered. Like Ooh. it's it's it, I'm like I'm reading this trick and I'm like good gravy. <laughs> I mean this 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 is a level of combat exploitation that I'm used to seeing in a Disgaea game and not a Final Fantasy game. Uh huh. But the yeah. uh, but but like, like there's really good juice to this combat. But I re- but I also think that like. The, the, again, the pacing of this game and the design of regular enemy encounters is is not in its favor. It's uh, I'm I'm, I'm sounding like a downer. I was enjoying Final Fantasy 13 for most of the journey. I really was, but but Me but uh, but Me by too. the by the end, I was sort of glad it was gone. It was done, and I have zero interest in going back to um to farm for trophies because uh, even even though the end game is where a lot of people find value. 
Yeah, like I said, I thought about it, and then yeah. I'm just like, eh, I don't know if I have time. <laughs> There's too many other games. I have to revisit 13.2 for another podcast. Um, oh, uh, let me tell I know a thing or two about, about playing games for podcasts. Let me tell you. Uh-huh. Oh, I, yeah, I, no kidding. I mean, I'm not going to tell you exactly what's on the retro encounter schedule, but <laughs> there's a lot. Uh-huh. Um, 13.2 really does address most of the issues I have with this combat system. Again, I'm not going to get into that here, but I'm just saying like they did listen to feedback for the sequel, which I do appreciate. I do own a copy of Final Fantasy 13.2. I found the special edition on sale for for very cheap a couple years ago. Yeah, me too. There is a real chance that I'll play FF 13.2 at a later date, but I am not going back for Adam and Toys Farming. But, yeah, to- um, totally valid. And 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 we should mention in Chapter 13, the last chapter of the game, they open up portals back to Chapter 12 and back to Chapter 11 for you to to engage in that kind of backtracking and farming that the game has otherwise denied you up to this point. But um, but af- but in Chapter uh, at the end of Chapter 10, you go you fight through the arc. Um, you get the dragoon summon for uh, for Fang. I'm sorry, the, the Bahamut summon for Fang, who is a dragoon, sort of. Uh, and uh, But then you find an escape pod that takes you da- down to Grand Pulse. And Chapter 11, as we discussed a bunch of times, is on the giant lush planet of Grand Pulse. You spend some time camping out, figuring out what to do. Um, Vanille gets the idea to go back to her and uh, Fang's hometown of Erba. So you follow clues, go through these, some mining tub- tunnels up this tower dungeon with friendly statues and Dahaka in it <laughs> to uh, mm-hmm. uh, to get to to get to Ereba and at the end of Ereba you're confronted by Parthandalus again. Yeah, you fight this you fight you fight this dude like three times. <laughs> yeah. Although he gets easier each time, I think. He I thought does, the, hard, the hardest enough. the hardest one I think was chapter 9. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, like the first time you fight him, I don't think you're quite prepared for that fight like cuz that is one of the first fights in the game that really does require like a good setup. Yeah. Like you, you have you have to be like on point with when you're switching. You have to switch quickly to to interrupt his attacks with sentinels. Um, but like by the end of it, again, I, I five starred the final Barthandalus fight too because it was just like okay, buff buff me, debuff him, and then just go to town. Yeah, like by then I really had figured out how to use paradigms, and and it was because in chapter uh, uh, chapter nine is finally when or well. Uh... I guess maybe chapter seven. Yeah, like chapter seven is when you finally get a three person party to work with again. Mm-hmm. And uh, and chapter nine is when I had full use of that of the the four people on the airship. So I I really figured out my my lightning fang hope setup and or lightning yeah. fang uh, fang saz setup. So uh, like chapter nine was when I got paradigms down. So I didn't think uh, Barthandalus was that much of a problem. Like I I had to replay some fights in this game, but they were usually just because of bad luck. And I knew, and I don't think I ever had to do a, a fight more than twice, except for I don't know, maybe some king behemoths or some of those, uh, some of the Sahagans in. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> in, had some in, bad in, luck in... with a couple behemoths. <laughs> yeah, one of the best places to farm to farm CP in Chapter Eleven is there's a behemoth and one of those giant wolves fighting each other. So it's it's extremely easy to get a preemptive strike and have them both start with half HP and they'll fight each other until one of them dies. So it's mm-hmm. yeah, uh, th- that's an easy way to get sixty five hundred H- uh, CP or so per uh, in a yeah. in a fast battle. In you, you can also you can also keep redoing the first undying battle, which gives you ten thousand CP every time you do it. Um, so that that's another easy farming one. Although apparently the best way to farm is end game when there's a big circle of three giant turtles up yeah. in, up north on the map, and you can just run around in circles and keep respawning them. Yeah, it, it's it's it, at the end game, it's definitely giant turtles, but I'm not in, that interested. In that. Oh, totally fine. Um, I know we were talking earlier that like the Final Fantasy 13 has weak villains, and I do agree. However, I really really like Barthandalus. I think he's a one dimensional cartoon character of a villain, but. His voice actor is having the time of his freaking life. Oh, yes. <laughs> the evil Pope. Yeah, the evil Pope. This dude is just, hmm, yes, let's see. <laughs> like, this, he's like, he is like, this guy looks like he's like barely containing a maniacal chuckle with every line <laughs> of dialogue. And then he turns into this giant, creepy robot death mask thing. And his music is all like, ha, ha, ha. And it's like, Wow, okay, I'm, this I'm just guy saying, is extra. <laughs> I'm just saying, if it's 2010 and I want to kill the evil Pope, I'll just play Assassin's Creed 2 because the final <laughs> boss of that game is an evil Pope. 
Yeah, you and, can just you can just fist fight the Pope. <laughs> and that and that game has a much more satisfying open world design than, than Final Fantasy XIII does. I'll take your word for it because I made it like five minutes into Assassin's Creed too. But that's a whole uh, other can of worms. <laughs> God, Assassin's Creed is somehow like twenty five games now. I I play I played three of them, only finished one of them, and decided that decided that my Assassin's Creed career was over. But no, but <laughs> people I like still that play the, them though. I like that the Egypt one is canon to Final Fantasy XV. Which, te- oh, yes. <laughs> which, te- about that. <laughs> which technically makes it part of Fabula Nova Chrysalis. <laughs> I, um, I mean, I again, the one that I know the best is Assassin's Creed Two, and that's the one that's canon to Soul Calibur Five. So, yeah, <laughs> Assassin's, uh, Assassin's Creed finds itself all over the place. No- no- Noctis is very fond of the Assassin's Creed series. Thanks, Ignis. <laughs> Ezio Auditore wins uh, bro, uh, god video hey, games uh, yeah, video games are weird probably not gonna have an assassin's creed episode of the podcast unless 2023 gets real weird which i mean we cover I assassin's creed now we've been covering it yeah, since um, origins <laughs> yeah assassin's creed oranges is how it's pronounced assassin's creed <laughs> Orange, oranges and odyssey are both rpg as hell so and i know that kate uh, valhalla too, yeah valhalla too Val, valhalla i've heard the extra content in that game gets so insane that like the completionist score on how long to beat is something like 200 hours um Ooh. but they uh but yeah they, um, that series has gone to a more rpg turn recently so uh maybe it's time for me to try one again because i maybe again i i thought one was kind of bad two was kind of great and uh uh revelations was not that impressive um which was i think the third that's assassin's creed 2-3 and in, in, uh, they got better from what i've heard they got better when they stopped pumping them out every year which is true of most that's things. probably true yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. Hey, Game Freak, take notes anyway. Mm. I should, you know what? I, I think, I, if anything, I should try, go back and play Assassin's Creed 4 because that's the one where you collect pirate shanties, and that's appealing to me. You know what? Pir- yeah, honestly, live your best pirate life. Yeah, I, I living my best pirate life doesn't sound so bad. But okay, okay, well, maybe let's talk about FF13 some more. But, okay, um, so uh, we're, we're, uh, we're, FF13, uh, not enough pirates, not enough, uh, not enough nonlinear areas, and zero. an end game that is confusing as hell. So, um, chapter uh, 13. Yeah. yeah, you you you. Uh, chapter twelve is just fighting through Eden and giving Rosh his final just desserts in a uh, an updated version of the Proud Clod um, uh, FF seven boss. Yep, and he gets like a super dramatic death scene um, where he like sets off a grenade on himself oh, while yeah. being swarmed by behemoths. And I'm just sitting there like, bye, buddy. <laughs> this is my choice as a human. Yeah. I had like, literally forgotten his name until you meet him again in chapter four. <laughs> it's, 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 honestly, same. It's like, oh, it's this guy. Right. Like, oh, right, him. Oh, Peter said he was in a magazine. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I swear to God, he was meant to be a more important character in some early draft of this story. I know. I think I think that's true of Jill, Rosh, and Sid. I think they were both supposed to, all three were supposed to have bigger roles, and then they didn't. Yeah, so, so it goes. What a waste of a good character design. <laughs> But uh, chapter twelve is a nonlinear corridor again. Uh, you're fighting through Eden, which is being attacked by monsters released by Barthendalus. So the populace of of Cocoon thinks that um, Pulse has gone to war with uh, with uh, with Cocoon again, and aren't aware that there aren't really any people on Pulse anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, no, no one knows like what's going on down there. They're just kept in the dark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you, you fight through all of all of it. And chapter thirteen is you. Uh, um, at the big cathedral or whatever at the center of eden has a you know unlocks a portal to orphan's cradle which is the area where orphan the giant powerful uh falci behind the curtain is is resting you fight through these you fight some motorcycles and some uh giant like space marine looking seeth called sacrifices Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, oh so we should probably mention too all of the surviving cavalry people including rigdia that like super that like long-haired dude who shows up in a couple cutscenes. the winter soldier guy yeah the winter soldier guy yeah exactly he looks like bucky barnes um but they they all turn into seath like instantly despite not being lassie yeah i didn't get that part or orphan and barthandles might be powerful enough to instantly lassie them and then instantly seath them Right, I, I guess they can do that if they're if they're if their focus is to become a Seath, maybe. Well, I don't I don't know I don't know how this works. The game doesn't bother explaining it, and I'm not going to try and suss it out. It was out. plot. It was yeah. the plot because needed plot. to happen because yeah. plot. Yeah, exactly. And you're you're guided by uh, some some eff- some falsy effigies through there, which I which I I guess are also controlled by Barthandalus. Because again, Barthandalus is rolling out a red red carpet for you now that you've gotten uh, big and strong on Pulse. 
and when you confront him at the end uh first you d defeat barthandalus a third time because that's just what barthandalus does he challenges you and loses and then he fuses with orphan to become a new consciousness of sorts you defeat that version of the combined barthandalus orphan and then you get some cutscenes that i still don't 100 percent understand what was happening in uh fang takes it upon herself to transform into ragnarok again because hundreds of years ago that's what happened she transformed into ragnarok and uh, and created a lot of damage on uh, on cocoon. The two worlds were separated, and then her, she and Fa and Vanilla were turned into crystal. So she tries to transform into Ragnarok again. Uh, she attacks Orphan without killing him. Vanille talks her back from the edge, so to speak. Uh, it looks like Lightning, Snow, Hope, and Saz are turned into Seath and attack Fang. But I think that might have been an illusion by Barthandalus, just to just to make Fang more and more upset and drive her into rage. Yeah, so uh, here's the thing, because like that is that makes the most sense in the context of what is happening in just Final Fantasy 13, because they get into Falsy smoke and mirrors early on before the fight. Mm -hmm. Barthandalus like sh 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 makes a big show of shattering Sarah and Dodge's crystals, and it's like obviously this is an illusion. He's just trying to rile you up. We know this is what this guy does. However, oh brother, <laughs> I'm not. I I will keep. I will try to keep this brief. But basically, thirteen two and the broader Fabula Nova Chrysalis lore basically implies that Etro is the one who's like intervening on everyone's behalf. So if they literally turned into Seath, then they don't become Seath anymore because Etro intervened. We do see that their brands are burned off, like um, like Fangs were after they come back. And at the end, in the final cutscene, they don't have their brands anymore. Um, and and Etro was also responsible for stopping Ragnarok the first time and turning Vanille and Fang into Crystal. That was the reason that they didn't destroy Cocoon outright was because Etro was like, nah, hold on. Um, so again, we're getting into literal divine intervention and the themes of this story being these long departed capricious gods that sometimes deign to intervene in human behavior because they like us or whatever. And and uh, and Lindsay Lohan and Etro Encounter are not mentioned at all in the text of the game. Lindsay is mentioned by name once in chapter 11. But, um, and and if you read the Analex, it does, they're all written from Pulse perspective. So they all are like, oh yes, Lindsay, the creator of that nest of vipers, Cocoon, and a glorious Grand Pulse. Which, um, actually, I want to get into this a second too. Um, the remember the cutscene where they first turn into Lucy in the beginning, that big CGI cutscene with the ringing bells and all that crap. Yeah, um, after mm -hmm. the anima boss fight. Yeah, so that creature that brands them is supposed to be Pulse. That is the that is the maker of the Pulse Falsy. Um, that they see in that vision. Um, I don't I I don't know really know what this adds to the story, but I thought it was interesting. <laughs> But yeah, basically, basically, the game does a very bad job of explaining how its mythology interacts with the whole world. But the whole idea of this story was to create a mythology that would inform other stories and kind of exist in the background. But if you're not familiar with that already, and audiences in 2010 definitely were not familiar with it already, then it's going to be a completely confusing non sequitur. And yeah, I I, yeah. I only had the vaguest idea of the motivations of Fang in this scene, Be, uh, like like I think she just was was she was full of rage and hurt, and she just wanted the, she decided to do the same thing that she did hundreds of years ago. Um, but uh, but ultimately that's what Barthandalus wanted all along. So she sort of pulled back from the edge, and uh, and your six characters together defeat defeat the final form of Orphan. And once you do, th but then right as they do that. As Orphan's dying and Pulse is about to crash into, uh, I'm sorry, Cocoon is about to crash into Pulse and destroy everything, um, Fang and Vanille turn into a giant column of crystal to, to to hold them off. So yes, they become Ragnarok and 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 stop it. Yeah, basically. but and yeah. the combined Ragnarok, which looks which looks sort of like this the solo Ragnarok that Fang became, but but much larger and uh and with some hecaton share tentacles on it. Or, yeah. Or, or, which I, I, I guess are vaguely supposed to represent um, uh, both Vanille's hair and the tendrils of her weapon and the tendrils of her summon Hecaton Share, I guess. <laughs> but like, 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 but th basically, they become a Ragnarok of support and protection, and not a Ragnarok of only destruction. 
Yep, is, that's basically it. Yep. And uh, so n- now the final scene of FF13 is on the surface of Grand Pulse, a giant crystal wave and column holding off Cocoon so that both worlds are destroyed. Um, oh, no, sorry. Both worlds survive, but Barthandalus is sort of destroyed or at least imprisoned in crystal. And, uh, and, and, uh, and the maker will not return to unmake and remake the world like Barthandalus was hoping. So it's a it's it's a somewhat optimistic ending, especially and and also you get um you get two uh beautiful hu- um running through the fields and into a hug scenes with with Dodge and uh, Sarah both um both in full human form uh like ready to meet your party again. So it's it's a little bittersweet because Fang and Vanille, who are your you know beloved party members, who were the the maybe the last two humans of nat- naturally born humans of Pulse. Uh, that uh, but but they like the home that they knew is dis- is destroyed. They were strangers in a strange land on cocoon, but them ultimately making a final sacrifice to uh, save to, cocoon to, 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 to save, save cocoon. The, the people of cocoon. Like I actually think their their ending is really beautiful, and I especially like how they're like holding hands and crystal like yes. in there. Like yeah, again, it, it is beautiful, but also it's I all... mean, don't, don't they undo all of that in the next one? <laughs> Yeah, so the the less said about the sequels plots, the better. Because I, I I've seen all of the main characters in materials related to Lightning Returns, is what I should say. So like I I know they're all in Lightning Returns. Ka- Ka- Caius essential Caius the villain in thirteen two essentially finishes the job that Barthandalus started. Although his goals are not, are are not um his motivations are not the same. His motivations are complex. No, I'm just kidding. No zero time dilemma references on this podcast, Peter. Bad. Um, uh, but basically, yes. Um, eventually, Cocoon does come. The, the crystal pillar is broken. Cocoon does start crashing down into the ground. Fang and Vanille are um, back and human again in Lightning Returns. It's kind of a whole mess, and I sort of prefer to can keep 13 as its own ending, and then the other two as a sort of side story. Because they really don't work as a unit, I don't think. Um, All right, let, let's definitely save thirteen two and others for another podcast. But uh, yes, but, but, but uh, Audra, uh, Audra, uh, what was your reaction and feelings about the game's ending? I actually I liked that it was more optimistic and hopeful. To say a pun on Hope's name, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I thought the Fane and Vanille part was touching, and I liked the whole idea of the people of cocoon actually setting foot on grand pulse for the first time and like the bringing of the two worlds together and i just like the reunions i thought it was sweet it's definitely a theme they were going for for sure yeah it is a very sweet scene yeah it's a beautiful ending scene all of the cutscenes in this game are gorgeous but i again i really felt like they were like they were finished before the the design of the game was finished and uh so and, and thinking back on it like if more of the game was like chapter 11 and the plot was a little bit better explained and there was, and the ed settings were just less empty, this could be a great final fantasy game. But my overall feeling is a little wishy washy. Like this game has good parts, but is ultimately a little disappointing. I, I, uh, yeah, I think that's fair. It's it's nowhere. I've played, I played basically every major final fantasy game other than 15 and and eleven and I don't I don't think thirteen rates in the top half for me not even close but it's but it was but it is definitely important for this era of Square Enix and yeah. it was a lot of what they were doing at the time and uh, it, it informs their design philosophies leading up to thirteen and after for thirteen because we've talked multiple times on how we can see parts of like uh, uh Peter the first half of FF fifteen a game that I know you love it's a little bit Grand Pulse Pulse of time, yeah, isn't it? For, for, uh, 15 is basically reverse 13 in that they were really trying to get away from the linear corridors. They wanted to make this game a big open world. And this was this was actually a design ethos from versus 13. They wanted thir- versus 13 to mirror 13. And and but then but then um, seven remake is uh, it does have the more focused design and is sometimes a little bit corridory like 13, but it sort of like fixes some of the mistakes of 13's non-linear design. Seven, Seven Remake is much better about hiding it because you can go back to old areas. There are NPCs to talk to. There are side quests. And it does, in general, the world feels like it has more texture, even though ultimately, like, yes, it is more linear corridors. But at the same time, these are dense corridors full of things to do and things to look at. And it's not just a big, sterile hallway populated by a few groups of mobs. 
And and wow. they uh they again they fixed all the problems of thirteen, but still brought back Hama Uzu because bringing back Hama Uzu was not was not a mistake at all. Hama Uzu is the MVP of the of the thirteen trilogy, and he is also a, just a magnificent composer in general. Yeah. Uh. So, yeah, that's my feelings. Like, I I didn't I don't think I, I did not hate this game, did but I found it sometimes really fun, sometimes confusing, sometimes disappointing. Uh. But overall, I'm glad I finally played it, and it was very nostalgic playing my PS3 practically all summer because that's how I played uh, Suikoden in June, and uh, and Tales of Exilia in July, and now Final Fantasy 13 in August. So um, I'm glad that I did not get a yellow light of death sometime in the last 90 days. Yeah, uh, right. And yeah, and uh, and you know it was a little bit nost- and I I sort of missed the uh, PS3 UI because I think the PS5 UI is a little lacking. I I sort of wish both of them were PS4. I miss <laughs> themes. <laughs> I'm, I, I like customizing my, your consoles and uh, PS, PS3 themes and PS4 themes were lots of fun. So now I have a lightning one. I had a uh, Shadow of the Colossus theme I use a lot and a Ratchet and Clank Tools of Destruction theme I use a lot on the PS3. Uh, classics. I lost my Korra play theme at some point at, during this playthrough. I don't know what happened. Oh, well, that's um, unfortunate. Yeah. But yes, yeah, Lucy, I'm really glad you you played this game too because I I, I I am glad I revisited it because I don't think I don't think this game deserves the hate it gets. I think that it is a very flawed game that tries to do a lot of things and doesn't always succeed. Yeah, this is an ambitious game that took some big swings, but some of them were misses, and you can tell that they were really plagued by a difficult development cycle. And uh, mm-hmm. and as as well and as a result, the game feels a little unfinished. Yeah, like I, I don't think that it's, I don't think even the parts where you're in corridors is, are horrible, but they just no. it just they just seem incomplete. And it is the most polished, yeah. unfinished game I've ever played. <laughs> yeah, that's and, a good way to describe it. Yeah, it's very polished, but but somewhat unfinished. Whereas fifteen is like massive in scale, but also buggy as heck, and. You, the gaps where 15 is missing content are much more obvious. Like both of those games suffered from long troubled developments. And I think we can take away from Fabula Nova Chrysalis. It ended in failure. They definitely have tried to distance itself themselves from it in recent years. And I think that Square is on a much better track than they were in 2010. Um, but at the same time, I really enjoyed going back and seeing what they were trying to do back then. I think so. I really liked playing this again and actually finishing it this time <laughs> yeah I, I again i'm glad i finally played it and i'm glad that i know a little bit more about this chapter of square enix's history because ever since i was a little kid my two favorite developers were capcom and square enix so it's uh, mm-hmm. it, it, like it, there was a little bit of a gap in my square enix uh, resume at, at, that i've finally filled in uh but i mean ff13 is a somewhat unfinished game but i think it is a little bit uh around the time to finish this podcast um thank you so much Audra and Peter for joining me on this episode uh, and and me finally playing Final Fantasy 13 for the first time. Like uh, our people uh, people that complain about semantics were like, but that game's not retro. Why do you call yourselves Retro Encounter? It's 2010. It's 12, it's 12 years ago. It's 12 years old, guys. <laughs> we're, we are we are playing a sixth or seventh grader, which sounds awful now that I've said it out loud. <laughs> yeah, let's um, not let's yeah, not okay, say right, that. Yeah, but right, 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 yeah. uh, well, uh, so we finished playing a 12 year old game. And uh, uh, next, we are going back into playing a oh, how does my math check out? A twenty-eight-year-old game because you know, I've mentioned this in previous episodes. But in September, we are playing Live Alive, the nineteen ninety-four Square classic that was recently remade for the Switch. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone on the uh, podcast is going to be playing the Switch version, including me. But that's another bit of Square or Square Enix lore that I am happy to cross off because that's that's another one that I've tried a couple times but never played. Um, and uh, so that's coming later this month. Also, we're not quite done talking about Fabula Nova Crystallis yet because, Peter, you are going to um, host an episode in a couple weeks about FF 132, 13 and possibly other games. Is that right? Yep, we're planning on talking about, um, about the 13 sequels and Type 0 and 15 in brief, just kind of talking about the Fabula Nova Crystallis concept and all of the other, like, all the other games that came out under this umbrella. So look forward to that. And also one last episode to look forward to. Uh, we are doing <clears throat> an episode on the 3DS uh, that should be coming next week. We did, uh, we, we've, we actually recorded it very recently. So that's a, that was a long, fun conversation about a lot of our favorite games on the 3DS. 
Uh, so please look forward to 3DS episode, more th- FF13, and Live Alive in September. And, you know, I, I, I think it is really enough to say this. Um, in October, we are playing a bunch of Adventure Games Month. We're uh, having a... Uh, we're going to have a, um, several adventure games played that month, starting with Secret of Monkey Island and then continuing through the Decades of Adventures, um, uh, playing four different adventure games from four different developers, but from some shared staff, starting with Secret of Monkey Island. So please look forward to a bunch of adventure games coming in October. But listeners, if you have questions for us about Final Fantasy XIII or the 3DS or Live Alive or Adventure Games, the best way to reach out to us is to email retro at rpgfan.com. You can also comment on our message boards, visit our Facebook page, uh, visit RPGFan.com on Twitter, check our Discord, our YouTube, our Instagram, uh, something streaming almost every evening uh, North America time on Twitch. Uh, please interact with RPG Fan however you choose. Also, somewhat recently, we opened up an RPG Fan store. You can find links to the RPG Fan store from RPGFan.com. It's hosted by T Public, and we have t shirts, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, pins, magnets, uh, phone cases, a bunch of RPG merch, excuse me, RPG Fan merch emblazoned with our Emerald Shield design on the RPG Fan store. But uh, Retro Encounter is not the only uh, podcast on RPG Fan. There's also Random Encounter every two weeks about randomness every, uh, and Rhythm Encounter every other two weeks about RPG music. Please rate and review Retro Encounter, Random Encounter, and Rhythm Encounter on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or however you listen to podcasts. Um, I was looking at the stats recently, and uh, Spotify outstrips all other venues for listening to Retro by a large margin. So... Maybe I should say Spotify first from now on, but uh, however you choose. That's how to, I listen to it. Yeah, however, <laughs> however you choose to listen to Retro Encounter, we appreciate you always. Um, but how do you, if you want to appreciate us directly, how can you find us directly? Let's tell you, starting with Peter. Uh, as always, if you want to reach out to me, you can find me on Twitter at I Have Fury. You can also email me Peter T at RPGFan.com. Now Audra. Audra B at RPGFan.com. And listeners, I'm easiest to find on Twitter. I am at the Real Monsoon most of the time, at Evoker for Dogs other times, and on RPG Fans Discord, I am Monsoon Mike. So yeah, I have a. Uh, I, I just finished this big long corridor RPG, and now I can split that off into a uh, into a anthology RPG. I, I don't I don't think there's any long corridors in Live Alive, are there? I, I've never played it. Uh, well, you know Ooh. what? I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Something to discover. It's going to be a big shift going from Final Fantasy XIII to Live Alive, but I am looking forward to uh, to meeting a whole new cast for a whole new month of Retro Encounter. Uh, listeners, thank you, good night, and good luck. Mm-hmm.